to introduce the speaker of tonight, Scott Morrison. Uh, I wrote down a few things about him, but uh, I guess most of you will know him very well already. So, uh, <clears throat> so Scott uh, did his undergraduate at UNSW and then went to uh, the University of California at Berkeley to his PhD, uh, which he completed in 2007 with uh, Vaughn Jones, uh, a field finalist. After his PhD, he went to work at Microsoft Station Q, which is led by another field finalist, Michael Friedman. So he's a He's been in good company for, uh, for uh, most of his career. Hopefully now still. <laughs> uh, so Microsoft Station Q is a, is a math research branch of, of, of Microsoft. They're doing things very much related to what we'll be talking about today. They're basically interested in quantum computation from a mathematical point of view. Um, so after Microsoft, uh, you were sent to Microsoft. Yes, that's the main branch. Okay. After that, he went back to Berkeley uh, on the Miller Fellowship, and in 2012 he uh, joined us at ANU, <coughs> where he immediately got a, a Decker Fellowship from the RC. Uh, it's been on since, uh, since starting here. So Scott's research is mostly in the area of category theory and quantum topology. I guess Scott will tell you what that means. But <laughs> uh, and he was awarded the Heide Medal, which is a early career research medal of the Australian Academy of Sciences last year for his research. So it's been really well received, I would say. But other than his research, he's also very well known for, uh, well, for one thing, for programming packages he helped develop, especially in log theory and then fusion categories, I think. And mostly also for uh, being co founder and moderator of a website called Math Overflow, which Sure, all of you have heard about once you start searching questions on Google about math, it usually points you to math overflow. It's like a question and answer site for mathematicians, but a serious one, not just blogs. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, we're very uh, happy that Scott is willing to tell us all about uh, uh, quantum topology, and in particular about uh, topological quantum computation. Um, please, welcome Scott. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, yeah, so tonight I'm going to be talking about computation, quantum mechanics, and just a little bit of topology. Um, I don't think I'm really going to get a chance to tell you really what quantum topology is, and I think that my own research is only going to come into this in the very last slide of the whole talk, assuming that I get there without Michael cutting me off. Um, so the, 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 the point tonight is really to, to try and explain something about what quantum computing is and uh, to explain a really crazy idea for building a quantum computer called, uh, called topological quantum computation. How I say it. Okay, very good. Um, okay, and we've already advanced to my next slide. Okay, so the, the talk's just going to be divided into, into three pieces. I'll talk for a little while at the beginning about what quantum computers can and cannot do. Uh, then we'll get into the, the meat of the talk and I'll try and explain what on earth a quantum computer actually is. And then at the end, I'll uh, tell you the story about one possible way to build one and, uh, and how that's going to affect uh, your plans. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, what can a quantum computer do? Well, <laughs> quantum computers can't do anything at all because they don't exist yet. And uh, this is a bit sad. Uh, a lot of people would like to have a quantum computer. Working on them. Uh, but saying that they don't exist yet is maybe not, not such bad news. Uh, our understanding of quantum mechanics at the moment says that we ought to be able to build one. In fact, I mean, they're, they're designed exactly to exploit how quantum mechanics works. So, in some sense, it's just an engineering problem, and a couple of things will happen, don't worry. <laughs> okay. uh, but even, even if we did have one, quantum computers couldn't actually do very much. So, I, I, I Maybe there's a dangerous starting sort of really <laughs> down in the dumps here, but I'll, I'll, we'll work up to a crescendo of excitement when we're computing in the moment. <laughs> so, uh, it really annoys me. Basically, every time I read a newspaper article or see a press release, or for that matter, annoyingly enough, hear talks given by professors who study quantum computing who should know better, um, quantum computers do not try all possible solutions to the problem in parallel universes, uh, no matter how many times people repeat that. Uh, and the, the goal that I have tonight is to try and 
give an explanation of what quantum computers do that is more honest than this stupid explanation, but uh, is also relatively understandable and without any scary mathematics in it. Uh, and hopefully people, the audience will heckle if I go out of direction too far, <laughs> walking on a tiger. Okay, so first of all I want to think about the not much that they could do if in principle we had one. <laughs> so more or less there are four things that we know that a quantum computer could do if we, if we had one. There are, there are maybe a few extra ones, but all of those ones have complicated caveats or a little bit unfair. So the, these are the four things that, that we really know a quantum computer could do. The first thing is that they can, they can search for needles in haystacks. So if you were to sit down and try and find a needle in a haystack, you'd expect it to take an amount of time proportional to the number of bits of straw in the haystack. You're just going to look at each one, check if it's a needle, and keep doing it. And a spectacular thing that quantum computers do, can do is find that needle in time proportional to the square root of the size of the haystack, right? which, is, which is impressive. Well, okay. Uh, the other thing that they can do, another thing they can do, is factor integers quickly. So we all know how to multiply integers quickly, 5 times 3 is 15, but going backwards is a much harder problem. And as far as we're aware at the moment, it's not possible to do it in polynomial time with a, with a classical computer. It might still be, but we don't know that it is possible. Uh, but there's an algorithm specially designed for quantum computers that lets you factor in quantum computers. Now, those two, uh, well, okay, and a, a consequence of being able to factor into this quickly would be that we would break a lot of the current encryption that people use. Uh, for example, when you talk to your bank, your quantum computer, you rely on, on encryption that is only strong because of this assumption that factoring into this kind. Now, while those are two things that quantum computers can, can do, I don't think they're actually super exciting. Uh, the first problem is, is generally called an unstructured search, where you just have a big pile of stuff that's just sitting there in a pile and you're trying to find one particular item out there. But no one actually does unstructured search in some sense. Uh, so it's not really, really clear that, that having that ability would be useful. Now, if we could do things uh, much faster, say you really believe this try everything in parallel universe is nonsense, say that you could search for needles in haystacks and say log it in time rather than square it in time. Now that would be really, really cool. Well, actually it would be a terrible disaster because all of us mathematicians here would lose our job right away. <laughs> because if you could search for needle, needles and haystacks that much faster, you could just go to a computer and say, look at all of the strings of 10,000 characters generated by, random, by monkeys typing randomly in a typewriter, and find one of them for me, which is a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> the way the quantum computer would, would fall now. Okay? A total disaster. <laughs> okay. uh, factoring integers, cool, you can break a whole bunch of encryption. But there are lots of alternative encryption schemes that are uh, that let you do a bunch of basically the same things, and which, as far as we can tell, are immune to quantum computers. And so it would be a big pain. The banks will have to switch their software and so on. But it wouldn't necessarily be the uh, world changing. The third one, here, yeah, simulating other quantum mechanical systems, is perhaps really the big deal, and it goes back to sort of the the, the origins of quantum computers. <coughs> Feynman talked about doing this well before there were alg the algorithms to do the, what I did these first two problems. And the point is just that there are lots of interesting real world systems out there, uh, superconductors, photosynthesis, things like that, which are extremely hard to model at the moment for classical computers, and we just have far, far better modeling simulating tools if we had access to a quantum computer. And I think that's the, the, that's the real place where, where uh, quantum computers will be more bad. Now, the, the fourth one. The most important one of all, um, <laughs> we can we can use use a quantum computer to approximate the Jones polynomial of a knot. Now tonight I'm not going to actually talk too much about topology or, or tell you even what the Jones polynomial is. But just sort of as a black box, what does it do? Well, here's a little picture of a knot. It's just a tied up piece of string, just a loop embedded in space, and there's some construction called the Jones polynomial. It takes a knot and it spits out some polynomial. This isn't quite a polynomial, I'm letting myself have negative exponents up there, but that's not a big deal. And I can stick in some value of q in this polynomial. For example, in this second line, I've stuck in some complex number of fifth root of unity, and I just get some number over here. The Jones polynomial of this knot and this root of unity is about 0.8 plus 0.6 times n. And something that quantum computers can do, but uh, that is slow for, for or apparently slow for classical is exactly this, evaluating 
these numbers uh, when you look at the Jones Project. Uh, that seems like an awfully specialized and specific thing to have on this list of all the algorithms for quantum computing. So the reason I've got that last one there is that incredibly, this problem of approximating the Jones polynomial uh, at some root of unity, this problem is exactly as hard as all of quantum computing. So what this means is, say one of you has a knack for, for doing this problem. I hand you a knob and tell you a root of unity, and you can just snap back at me in polynomial time a good approximation to, to the, the value of that polynomial. Then we needn't bother building quantum computers, because you'll be able to simulate that quantum computer by your amazing ability to do this evaluation plus access to just an old-fashioned classic. Okay? So these are equally hard problems. Uh, if, uh, if you're interested uh, in why, why it is exactly this hard, you can look at, for example, the slides of my talk I gave on Monday up in, up in Brisbane, and I, you can see that the sketch of this theorem is not actually super difficult once you know what the Jones polynomial is and once you know what quantum computer is. Okay, so this prompts the question, Given that there's, there's apparently this, this really deep connection between some, some thing in topology, the Jones polynomial of knots, and quantum computing, why do they have anything to do with each other? That's, it's just bizarre that quantum computing has something to do with, with knots. Uh, and I don't think anyone really has a satisfying answer to this. Why does this, uh, why does this connection between the two subjects? But even though we're, it's, it's a bit of a mystery, this connection uh, has suggested uh, a really intriguing recipe for building a, a, a quantum computer that's, that's in particular based on uh, the fact that there are some, there are some, uh, there are some real physical devices that can apparently compute the Jones polynomial for us, and so we're going to use those to build a quantum computer. And that is what I'm going to get back, back to you right at the end of the video. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> 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 are you leaning on the light switch up there? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So that was all I'm going to say about what a quantum computer can and can't do. And now I'm going to try and, well, we're going to get to the difficult bit of the talk, when I'm going to try and explain what a quantum computer actually is. So there's going to be a little bit of mathematics in here. Uh, hang on, Jack. <laughs> what is uh, well, what, is, what is quantum computation? Well, before we end, try and answer the question, let's, uh, let's ask what is classical computation first? Okay? This is going to be a bit easier, um, and, and uh, well, it will hopefully show us if we need it. Okay. So, an algorithm for, for our purposes tonight is just something that takes some input and processes, it, processes that input according to some fixed rules and produces an output. So, a recipe for making a cake. It's a lovely example of an algorithm. But tonight, instead of making cakes, uh, the input for our algorithm is just always going to be a binary string, a string of zeros and ones, and the output is just going to be a single bit of zero or one. And uh, in some sense, you can sort of build all sorts of algorithms just like this, so you're not really going to be anywhere in the Okay, so what is, a, a, what is a classical algorithm then? Well, a classical algorithm takes that, that binary string the zeros and ones, and applies a sequence of Boolean logic gates to that input, uh, eventually producing one bit as, as output. Sorry, I thought I had a zoom. So, okay, oh well. Um, okay, so imagine here that we put in a uh, um, three bits here as the input. So if our string maybe is, uh, let's say, one, one, zero, okay? That means we're going to put a one in on this line, a one in on this line, and a zero in on this line. The information is going to propagate through this from left to right, and uh, the names on the box are going to tell you what to do. Uh, well, I guess I keep first is maybe a little translation. I've said that the inputs are zeros and ones, but we've got to sort of set up a dictionary that uh, one and zero mean the same thing as true and false, and you can understand what ends and ors and nots mean. And I guess you can keep going, and one and zero can mean uh, true and false, or high and low, or uh, left and right. Or Blue or red, or good or evil, or no or standard, whatever you want. So, ones and zeros are the same thing as truth and false. So, we put a one and a one in here, 
and the end of true and true, of course, is just true. Um, there's an XOR gate, which is, just gives you a, a one on the output of exactly one of the inputs is one and the other one is zero, and so on. Okay? I don't think this circuit does anything useful or interesting in terms of work out exactly what it did to do that. Maybe one thing to point out is actually kind of one hidden gate in this circuit, which is this little fork here, which takes a bit and makes two points. That's, a, that's an interesting thing that you can do in the classical world of losing the So let's actually write an algorithm now with this, uh, with this formalism. So here's an algorithm that solves the problem. Is an integer at least eight? Okay, so you take your integer and you write it as a binary string and you stick it into this circuit. So say we take the integer 10, which we can write in binary as uh, 1, 0, 1, 0. That's, so we're going to stick that in here. I need a laser pointer to stick this in here. Now we're in control. Okay, so we're going to stick in a, a one there. Oh no, sorry, one there and a one there. Zero, zero, zero. Okay. So what does this circuit do? Well, it throws away the lowest three bits of our binary string because we don't really care what the, number, what, the, what the ones digit or the twos digit or the fours digit of our binary number is. And then we just use all together all of the other bits. Okay. And the point is that any number that any number that's eight or higher has a one in its binary expansion somewhere above the third bit, and so we get a one out. Great. Okay. Now, uh, can someone see a problem with this circuit for solving the problem is a number bigger than eight? At least eight. You have to go infinitely far. I have to go up infinitely far. Yeah, this is a problem. This only works on seven digit binary numbers. Okay. So this is a technicality, um, which we're just going to finesse for now. Uh, really what I mean by, or really what we should mean by an algorithm is that it's some family of circuits, one for each input size. And when you get an input and write it as a binary string, you look how long that string is, and then pick up the circuit from a different switch of that length, and, and follow the binary logic of that circuit. Now, if we do that, we have to be a little bit careful. We need to have some rule that says that our family of circuits doesn't get more and more and more complicated in some really fancy way as we go up to bigger inputs. Because it's possible to cheat by having really complicated circuits for larger inputs. And so you have to have some rule that, that there's some easy way to write down the whole family. And an interesting exercise, if anyone cares about this, is to show that all the possible reasonable rules you could write down about the family being easy to write down all give the same notion of number. Okay. Yes, so we really have to allow families of these to be precise. Okay, so that's a classical computer. You take a uh, binary string with some inputs, you shove it through some binary logic gates, and, uh, and read out one bit of the Zooms in the wrong place. Okay, so uh, let's now, rather than jumping straight from classical computing to quantum computing, let's have another warm-up step and talk about probabilistic computing. Now, uh, in some sense, probabilistic computing is really easy. It's just a very minor modification of the classical computing we're talking about. But in another sense, it's almost the entire way to quantum computing. That's almost as complicated. So pay attention. Uh, all that we do is add one extra gate in our, in, our, in our system, which we can call a coin toss, and all that it does is produces a random bit. 50% uh, of the time it produces one, 50% of the time it produces a, a percentage. I have heads and tails to my long list of working in Stanford. Uh, so we just allow all the same gates as we had before, all the, line, all the Boolean operations, and we can also do Tosses for you know, new random bits as we go along. So I guess so something uh, a bit more complicated is going on now. The output of our circuit, you might think of it as being some probability distribution. It's some percent chance that we'll get a zero at the end of the day, and some percent chance we'll get a one at the end of the day for each given input. And we say that we've got a probabilistic algorithm for some problem. If our, if our circuit that involves coin tosses produces the right answer, the appropriate answer for each input, at least two thirds of the time. Okay. Now, two thirds isn't very important here. You could put nine tenths or 99 out of 100, whatever you like. The point is, if you want to get, if you want to be more sure that you're getting the right answer, you can just stick the same input into your random circuit a few times and just take the majority of both of the outputs you get. And if you can, as long as you can get a majority of the time right with your circuit. Running the same circuit multiple times, you can get arbitrarily good, 
you can you can you write an arbitrary large fraction of this. Okay. So <coughs> let me uh, just give an instance here of a really nice uh, probabilistic algorithm for a problem. So uh, suppose that I've got two polynomials, p of x and q of x, and let's suppose they've both got some, some maximum degree, some fixed degrees p. But I don't really have the polynomials written down in front of me as sort of x squared plus, plus 3x plus 1, something like that. I've just got them as black boxes, okay? Well, I can stick in some number, and the black box will, will spit back out again the value of the polynomial at, at that moment. Okay? I can know the good evaluations. And the question I want to ask is, are these two polynomials I've got identically the same polynomial? And it's a beautiful probabilistic algorithm. So first of all, we just do a bunch of coin tosses at the beginning to pick some random integer y that's somewhere between 0 and 3d, okay? three times whatever the degree of the polynomial is. And then we just do a single evaluation of our polynomial. Uh, we evaluate both of our polynomials at that random point y, and we check if those two numbers that we get out are the same. And if those two numbers happen to be the same, we say, sure, the polynomials are the same, no worries. And if the, two, well, if the two values are different, we say, no, 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 the polynomials, the polynomials must be different. And what you can prove is that this is, this is gives the correct answer of these two thirds of the time. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to see this. Certainly, if you get different answers out from p of y and q of y, the polynomials have to be different. But it's also not too hard to see that you get both the answer the time you write most of the time anyway, because in amongst these numbers 0 up at 3d, well, these polynomials only have degree d, if you know about roots of polynomials. There are only, only of those 3D numbers, only at most D of them could be a, a root of P minus Q. Okay, so two thirds of the time it's working. It turns out, so there's, there was a, ske a sketchy proof of that algorithm. This algorithm also works for multivariable polynomials, polynomials of X and Y and Z and so on. Then it's a little bit harder to prove that this algorithm works most of the time, but it really does. And rather amazingly, there's not, there's not a deterministic algorithm that's, that's as fast as this random. As far as we know, you genuinely need to use a random algorithm to do polynomial identity verification fast. I just learned this recently because I had to use it for a paper. Right? You need to check two polynomials with the same thing and have black boxes. That's kind of amazing. Uh, okay. Um, so here's a probabilistic computation. We're allowed to use coin tosses along the way. And at the end of the day, we get a probability distribution of zeros and ones, not just a definite output. Okay? Some percent chance zero, some percent chance. Okay, I think we're ready to jump in now and uh, actually answer what is quantum computation. Well, during a quantum computation, the intermediate steps after we've applied some of our gates aren't just binary strings anymore. Uh, we're, we're allowed to use formal linear combinations of binary strings. So I'm always going to write my binary strings like I've written there. This funny notation, a vertical line and a pointy bracket afterwards, uh, just so I can write numbers in front of them and not maybe get them confused. This is also the physicist's notation. So, as well as this guy, some binary string with zero on the first wire, one on the first wire, and zero on the last wire, we're allowed to have these formal linear combinations. <coughs> it just means uh, some number times this, this state plus some other number times this state plus some other number times another state. And I'm even going to allow you to write. Uh, negative coefficients out the front. Uh, and if you really want to be uh, you're very liberal about it, I'm going to let you write complex numbers. Well, amusingly, it's not necessary. You do quantum computing if you want to. Okay, so we've got this funny situation here where we'll, we'll do an example in a moment where, where we've got formal linear combinations of binary <coughs> strings as the intermediate steps in our computation. Now, what do, the, what do the gates do? We're not going to use the Boolean gates anymore. Um, I'm going to tell you that you're just going to use these two gates, the Hadamard gate and the Toffoli gate, but there are lots of other choices, and it's not really essential which choice you make. These are just a convenient and simple one. Uh, so we're not going to use Andador and coin tosses and so on, we're just going to use these guys. So what do they do? Well, the Hadamard gate, uh, here's a picture of it here, it just acts on a single stream, okay, on, a, on a single wire in our circuit, and it sends uh, a zero on that stream to this funny linear combination, 1 over square root 2 times the, the, the zero state, plus 
plus one over square root two times the one that stayed on the wire. And the Hadamard gate sends the one that stayed on the wire to one over square root two times the zero state minus the one state. Now, uh, well, okay, uh, we'll, we'll come back and see the example. Let me just tell you what the Toffoli gate does. It's pretty complicated. It acts on three wires at once. So here you can see a Toffoli gate drawn across these three wires here. And it never touches the values on the, on the top two wires that come through. Whatever value comes in here just goes out the other side. And on the bottom wire, all that it does is it flips the value exactly if both of the upper two strings was carrying on one. Okay? So you can see here, I think it's arranged in columns here. The first three columns here, uh, well, the first two numbers aren't both ones, and nothing's happening. The Toffoli gate just passes everything through the three dimension. But in the last column, where the first two wires are both carrying a one, we're flipping the last wire, which is going to go zero to one, one to zero. This guy would actually be a perfectly good classical Boolean gauge here, the Toffoli gauge. But we're using it in a quantum context now. Okay. So let's now look at an example, uh, an example quantum circuit, and see what happens. So I'm going to uh, start by putting, sending in a zero, zero, zero in this quantum circuit, and see what this succession of gates does. I'm first going to apply this gate on the top wire, then I'm going to apply this, this up to the second part of my gate on the second wire, and finally I'm going to apply it to fully gate across all three wires. So what happens? Well, we start with 0, 0, 0, and we apply a kind of my gate just on the first wire, so it just leaves alone all of the values on the other wires. So of course this 0 and this 0 at the end here <coughs> pass the one chain, which is the two zeros there. But then on the first, on the first entry of our binary stream, it does, it acts by the formula we've got up here, it changes this zero to one over square root two times the zero state, plus one over square root two times the, the one state. And now we apply the second pattern by gate on the second wire, and it does exactly the same thing. It ignores the first and the third wires, the values there just pass through unchanged, and it just follows that rule again, acting on the second digit now. But what, the, the essential thing here that I, I'm only telling you through this example, is that it's acting linearly. So when I've got this, this formal linear combination up here, to work out how the Hadamard gate works with this, I just work out how it works on each term and just add up the answers to how it's at work, working on each term. So this guy here will be sent to this guy plus this guy. And now we've got, we're going to have two factors of one over square root two, so I end up with a factor of one half up front. And the Hadamard gate also acts on this term, we lose this term and this term. And then finally, the Toffoli gate acts on each of these terms separately, then what does it do? It does nothing here, nothing there, nothing there. And here, because the first two bits are one, it flips the third bit. So this is how you, this is how you interpret a quantum circuit. Taking some, some binary string as input at the beginning and producing some formal linear combination of binary strings at the end. Okay? Any questions? That was the hardest bit of the talk, so if you survive that, it's all, it's all done. Okay. Uh, okay. So, one more thing. Uh, so, after we've applied our quantum circuit now, we've got this, this nonsensical thing, this formal linear combination of states that came out at the end. But we're meant to prove using just a zero or one. Okay? That's what it means to run an algorithm. So, we do a measurement. Okay. What does a measurement mean? Well, we go look up the rules of quantum mechanics. And it tells us that if we see at the end of the day some state, which is some formal linear combination. So here I've written uh, a sum over all possible binary strings W, where the coefficient of the string W is this number AW. Okay, so in our last example, those numbers were all one halves. Okay, then the way we work out the probability of seeing zero as the output of our, of our, uh, of our algorithm is that we just look at all of the strings starting with a zero, and we add up the sums of the squares of whatever the coefficients in front of that number have been, or the sums of the absolute values of the squares if you want to come up with Okay, and so this is a rule that says you get zero some percent of the time, one some percent of the time, based on whatever formal linear combination you've got added up on the And exactly as before, with the probabilistic uh, algorithm, we just say that we've got, a, we've got a quantum algorithm for a problem. If this recipe, for, for, for determining probabilities, gives the appropriate answer at least two thirds of the time. Okay. And that's, that's now the full definition of what a quantum computer is. Um, so, what do I, well, okay, let 
let's just say all that again one more time. Uh, so in a quantum computer, oh, I guess there's something I meant to say in between, but I'll say it now. In a quantum computer, we allow linear combinations of states, just like in a probabilistic computer. Right? We didn't have linear combinations of states before we were doing probabilistic computers. What do I mean? Well, we can think of the the, uh, the probabilistic computer coin here as the coin toss uh, gives us one half times the zero state plus one half times the one state. That gives us a chance of one and gives us a chance of zero. And if you think about it, basically all of the rules are the same for quantum computers and probabilistic computers. Uh, you still uh, when you, when you had some, some mixed state like this and you want to apply some new gate, you just apply it to your time separately and multiply the coefficients that you had before. We, but there, there are just two differences between a probabilistic computer and a quantum computer. The first one is that in a probabilistic computer, all of these coefficients that ever appear have to be positive numbers. There's just no such thing as a, as a negative probability. Okay? And the second difference was that in a quantum computer, when we wanted to... Um, so maybe, uh, so this means 50% chance of a zero. That also means 50% chance. But in a quantum computer, to interpret the probabilities, we didn't just look at these coefficients themselves and say, oh, that's the probability. I had to take these numbers, square them, and then that was the probability. Okay? So that's the only difference between classic computer and probabilistic computer. We're allowed to have negative coefficients in these formal linear combinations, and we have to square them before we're allowed to interpret them as probabilities. So let's just, as a little example, see the amazing effect that this has and why something's a bit different from quantum computing. So let's start with a zero state and apply the Hadamard gate. Let me just jump back so you can see the definition of the gate. Just the Hadamard gate at the top. So zero just goes to this formal linear combination. 1 over square root 2 plus 0 plus 1 over square root 2 times 1. Notice here that the, the total probability of this state is 1. This is one coefficient here, it was 1. And still the total probability is 1 here. If you, if you, if you add up, you, if you take 1 over square root 2 and square it, you get 1 half, and 1 half plus 1 half is 1. Okay? So this is sensible in the sense that the total probability is 1. So in particular, if we, if we stop at this point, and, and, and measure the outcome of our algorithm, it's kind of boring. We just ignore the input, and 50% of the time we got a 0, 50% of the time we got a 1. And so far, it's kind of like a probabilistic algorithm, ignore the input, and flip a coin. Okay? But if we apply a Hadamard gate again, something kind of fancy happens. So we get, leave that 1 over square root 2 out the front, and now we get 1 over square root 2 times 0, plus 1, plus 1 over square root 2, 0, minus 1, and what happens here, well, the, the 1 states exactly cancel, because they've got the same coefficients except for a sign, uh, and uh, the 0 states all add up nicely to just give us the 0 state. So we did something that you just can't do in the classical world. We took this 1 state, sent it to something that when you look at the probabilities, just looks like a uniform mixture of 50% of the time 0, 50% of the time 1, but then we did something else again and got back to 0, and you can check if you did the same thing starting with 1, the same thing would have happened. Okay? So this is something you just can't do in the classical world. And in some sense, this, this cancelling of coefficients is, is really what makes all quantum algorithms work. And if you just can't do in the probabilistic world, positive numbers just don't cancel. Okay. Okay, so quantum computers are just like <coughs> probabilistic computers, we allow linear combinations. So the coefficients now can be negative numbers. To interpret probabilities, we've got to take absolute value squares of those coefficients rather than the coefficients themselves. And, well, we only allow particular gates. In the presentation I gave here, just that Hadamard and Toffoli gate. You're allowed to uh, be a little bit more flexible if you want. Uh, you can use any gate that preserves <coughs> the probability according to these rules is allowed and gives you an equivalent notion of quantum computations. How's everyone feeling about this so far? You look unhappy. Just, just, okay. 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 Do you want, do you want the question? Yes, I want the question. Yes. Well, I mean, 
in the states you're working at here, you're effectively working in a sort of finite dimensional level. Yes. Space, yes. Right? Yep. So you're talking at the beginning of the talk that it's rubbish that quantum computers do infinitely many things for too many times. Yeah. Does, does the theory of your, the underlying theory of all this work if you do it in a dimensional level? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that, that my objections to people talking about parallel universes care about whether we're doing finite dimensional or quantum mechanics. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. And for people who really believe in parallel universes, can you talk about computing? I mean, here's a really, really good article to solve the difficult problems. Okay. Uh, <laughs> flip some coins to generate all the possible inputs. Okay. And in each of the parallel universes, you've now got. Check if that input you've got satisfies some wonderful property, like being a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. In all of the parallel universes where it's not a proof of the Riemann hypothesis, shoot yourself. <laughs> now in all the universes where you're still alive, you've got a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not a joke. I think that's a perfectly serious objection that people are talking about. Okay. So, okay. so I've tried to explain, without getting grumpy about people talking about parallel hypothesis, <laughs> what is a quantum computer? Um, how are we going for time? Uh, have like 10 or 15 minutes left? Or? 15. Yeah, 15. Oh, okay. There we go. If we really go, if we really go 15, let me click on this link here. Um, here's a, a cool quantum circuit simulator that you can run. Um, so here are our input strings. We can change their labels whether they start off as zeros or ones and so on. Um, let's put down a Hadamard gate. Uh, actually, let's just change it for a moment so we've just got a single, a single bit coming in with a hat and forget. And let's run that. And it says, sure enough, you see a 0 50% of the time and a 1 50% of the time. And let's stick another hat and my gate in. And we run that again. And it says, oh, you've got a 0 all the time. Or if you put in a 1, it says, you've got a 1 all 100% of the time. And so on. Uh, and it works. Let's give ourselves a few more bits. Put another hat in my gate there. Let's put it roll the gate there. Okay, let's run that. You can check my work on the slide before. It tells you all of the probabilities. Uh, I mean, over here it's telling you the well, what I'm what you're officially meant to call the amplitudes, that is the coefficients out in front of those states. And then over the right it's showing us the, the absolute value squares for these things. Okay. So you can you can do lots of stuff with this little Q program. Even got quantum Fourier transforms as a little box. So you can implement Shaw's algorithm and fact integers and things like that if you want to. It's pretty neat. Okay. So there we go. That was uh, an, a, a mathematical definition of what is a quantum computer that was pretty close to the truth. So <laughs> better than most versions you hear. Uh, okay, so now we get to the, the hard end. How can we build one of these wonderful devices that is able to approximate the Jones polynomial? Um, well, there are many different models for building a quantum computer. And there's a very promising one. Uh, it's, I think it re it's originally maybe a paper of this guy Kane that proposed it. Lots of people have suggested variations. Um, and it, it basically uses some very familiar technology. We've got some slab of silicon at the bottom. At the top, we've got some little metal gates sitting over the silicon that let us uh, apply voltages. And the only exotic bit is that down the silicon just below the surface, we've got individual phosphorus atoms embedded in the silicon. And uh, we're now using the, um, the quantum mechanical spin of the outermost electrons on this phosphorus to carry our quantum bits up and down, our zeros and ones, and our formal linear combinations up them. And we arrange all of our gates, our, our interactions between the strings by, by putting voltages on these metal gates above to control the interaction between the phosphorus strings. And it's a pretty plausible idea if you could really do this and, and generate the right interactions between the, the phosphorus spins and then scale this up to a good scale, you'd have a quantum computer. And lots and lots of people have tried to do exactly this. And I think that the, the quite big Australian group, um, perhaps centered around Linus W, but other places as well, is essentially following this kind of model for building a quantum computer. And I think it's probably the sensible way to build a quantum computer. Um, Probably work, I expect, um, but I don't think it's very really fun because it doesn't involve the Jones polynomial. And so <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you a much crazier plan for building a quantum computer. Now, uh, 
it's crazy because it involves much more fun ads than this first approach. But it's not, it's not really crazy in the real world. Um, it's very, very difficult, this plan I'm going to propose. Uh, and, I, and if you had to bet money, you'd certainly bet on these guys instead of on this plan. But it has a, somehow a completely orthogonal set of engineering problems uh, to, to get to where we wanted to get. And so uh, if one approach fails because of engineering difficulties, there's no reason that the other one will, will fail as well. So it's, uh, it's certainly not unreasonable to pursue both at the same time. There's actually a really, really fantastic reason to follow this, this crazy plan which is that it has this sort of intrinsic error correction quality. Now, this, this basic plan is kind of dangerous because every time you screw up a little bit and the plan the wrong calls on one of these gates or have one of your crossword challenges interact with something you buy in just the wrong way, everything falls apart and you lose your careful control of the linear, com linear combinations of states that are essential to, to, to the quantum algorithms. And so you, if you're going to build a quantum computer according to this sort of standard scheme, you're going to have to put in sort of software error correction. Your algorithm is going to have to be incredibly more complicated in order to cope with the errors that are inevitable as well. And a really lovely, well, a really lovely aspect of this crazy plan is that it has error correction built in at the hardware level in a really intrinsic way. And so even if it's much harder to build, you might be getting something more than the standard approaches you might So it's a very good deal. And I'll, I'll try and point to the right place or two where this intrinsic error correction comes in in this crazy plan. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of physics now, um, actual real physics, and quantum mechanics isn't actually real physics. Quantum mechanics belongs to us, it doesn't belong to the physicists. <laughs> so this stuff now belongs to the physicists. Um, and so I don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm giving a, uh, I'm giving a very idealized version of the story here, um, a mathematician's fairy tale of how the physics works. Okay? <clears throat> Just one. Okay. So there's this amazing thing called the fractional quantum Hall effect, which physicists see in the real world and give each other Nobel prizes for. And uh, its physics is apparently, or in our wildest dreams, accurately described by a thing called the topological quantum field theory. And I'm going to explain what that is in a minute. So how do you get one of these fractional quantum Hall effect devices? Well, you take two slabs of gallium arsenide. You don't just take two slabs and squish them together. You grow them very carefully. And they're slightly different because of the way you've doped the crystals. And then in the interface between these two slabs, something very, very special happens. And you get this, uh, well, at point one between Kelvin and gigantic magnetic fields that kill you if you walk in the room, you get this, this, this two-dimensional electron gas. And what we're going to imagine for now is that we've got a little puddle of this very special material, this fractional quantum hole effect. And then maybe this puddle <coughs> has some holes in the middle. Maybe the, the holes are there by accident, we were just taking advantage of them. Or maybe we put them there by poking holes in our device as we were building it. Okay, so we have a little punctured disk in, in our world. So, well, in very general terms, what is quantum mechanics meant to do? Well, it, every time you, you show a physical <coughs> system, it's meant to tell you the possible quantum mechanical states of that system. And those are usually described as vectors in Hilbert space. And it's also meant to tell you, when you do something to this system, how all those vectors change in the space. And that's going to be given to you in the form of a unitary matrix, which you can just think of as an app, as a, as a, like one of those rules I was giving you described in the two quantum gates. Okay. So here's the, the first amazing uh, fact about the fractional quantum Hall effect. There are multiple ground states, uh, multiple quantum mechanical states all with the same lowest energy. And this is extremely unusual. In, in most physical systems you see, there's just a unique ground state, just one state with the lowest energy, and then lots of other states higher up with higher energies. People even say, nature of war is a degeneracy, saying that it's extremely hard generally to have this, uh, this multiple ground states with the lowest energy. And another nice, amazing fact is that the number of these ground states actually depends on almost nothing. It depends on just the number of holes you have in your puddle but it doesn't depend on their sizes or shapes or where they are in the puddle. It just depends on the topological information of how many holes there are in this. The whole Hilbert space is big and complicated, but the, the ground state, the collection of lowest energy states, has this topological invariance that increases the number of holes. Oh. And so our idea for doing quantum computation 
was that we're going to stick all of our linear combinations of binary streams that our quantum circuits have to act on inside this collection of ground states of the fractional quantum ball of those types. Okay. Now, remember, quantum mechanics doesn't just tell you the, the, the space of quantum mechanical states associated with your system. It tells you what happens when you do something with that system. So let's imagine now moving those holes around each other inside the pipeline. Okay, this is maybe getting a little bit ridiculous when you go and talk to an engineer and he's going to start laughing at you. <laughs> but uh, let's imagine that we can, we can stick our fingers in these holes and move them around. Now, whenever we move them around, uh, quantum mechanics tells you some unitary matrix that describes how all the quantum states change. And the second amazing fact is that that unitary matrix doesn't depend on the geometry of the motion of the holes at all. It only depends on the topology of the motion of those holes. So if I um, well, maybe which is more complicated than it needs to be. But if I just take two of the holes and move them smoothly around each other, I'll get some unitary matrix telling me what happens. But if I move them in some really complicated way, but they still go around each other the same number of times, I'll get exactly the same unitary on the nodes. The state changes in exactly the same way. And so thus, for every way of braiding the holes around each other, we get some, some transformation of the quantum mechanical states that only depends on the topology of this braid. Not the, not the details of how our four engineers managed to make this happen for us. Okay, so this setup, oh, okay, so, okay, so this is all I'm going to say about the fractional quantum ball effect, and we're now just going to retreat into, into mathematics for a little while. Um, this setup, for each punctured disk, we've got some vector space of, of states, and for each braiding, we've got uh, some unitary matrix telling us how those vector spaces transform, is called a, a two dimensional quantum field. Well, not exactly, but uh, I can make that precise if you wanted me to. But I'm glad to know. Um, the, okay, so here's the amazing, uh, the amazing fact about basically all the ways of doing this is that if you choose some way of embedding your your binary strings into the into this collection of quantum states of, of these punctured disks, well, each of the quantum gates, each of the Hadamard gate and the Toffoli gate that we're talking about, you can approximate them very well by some complicated grade. So by grading the holes around each other in some complicated way, you can do something very close, not exactly the same, but very close to either of those two quantum gates that we needed to build a quantum circuit. And this tells us that whatever quantum circuit you wanted to apply to your, to your linear combination of binary streams, you can always achieve that by performing some grading of the holes. And so this then gives us a recipe for the topological quantum computer. So you look at the, the input string you've got for your algorithm, you pick some number of holes that's sufficiently large that you can fit your binary strings inside the, the quantum mechanical state for a disk with that number of holes. You go away and build a, build a puddle with that many holes. And then you, uh, you input your, your initial binary stream, your input for the problem as a, as a quantum mechanical state, you braid the holes around, and then according to a braid that approximates your quantum circuit, uh, and then you perform a measurement to read out uh, a single bit, some probabilistic distribution of a single bit, and, uh, and that'll be your answer. Okay, so this is sort of the mathematician's idealization of how you would do this. There are a bunch of more complicated versions that are a little bit less uh, hilarious to engineers, <laughs> and the, the the people at station Q, both in the lab groups, lab groups. <laughs> <laughs> both the theory group and the lab groups, are, uh, are working in various ways on, on implementing uh, this recipe. Okay, so I haven't said anything whatsoever about what I do. So I have one slide at the end where I can just say something about what I do. Uh, and this is the question of what TQFTs are there out there? What ways of associating vector spaces to punctured disks and, and maps to, to gradients are there? Well, and also some slightly more general things. Well, a lot of my work is trying to classify the possible TQFTs uh, that, that are out there and, um, and also to discover new, new examples. And so it's, I think it's uh, a really fun subject. We get to use methods from Algebra, combinatorics, topology, number theory, graph theory, analysis, it really comes from all over the place. Uh, and what do we see at the moment? Well, the TQFTs that we know about at the moment, most of them fit in into some big families. Some families coming from finite group theory, some families coming from 
quantum groups and various constructions applied to those, and it looks very orderly and nice. And then there's just a very small number of kind of sporadic examples, exotic examples of TQFTs that don't seem to come from anywhere, they're not connected to any other, anything else in mathematics that we've ever seen. Uh, and we sort of don't know what they, this should tell us about the classification of TQFTs. Should we hope that these sporadic cases are actually parts of bigger families that we don't understand yet? Um, are they maybe just a finite number or some small number of sporadic cases besides these very uniform families? Or perhaps it's just a total disaster. We haven't looked very far, we're not very clever yet, and eventually these sporadic cases that are all just a random jumble of things will just take over and, and it's going to be a big mess that we're never going to understand. I don't know yet, but that's a lot of uh, what I, I think about things. Um, the, the thing that we have found in all this work so far is that at every step there are sort of fewer TQFTs out there than you expected beforehand. It's very hard for these things to exist, and the, the sporadic examples that do exist seem to be extremely special. Highly symmetric objects. Hopefully, there's a good reason for them to be there, but uh, it's a little bit unclear. Okay, so the sort of questions uh, we think about connecting these classification problems to TQFTs back to what I've been talking about. Well, I said there was this amazing fact that most TQFTs allow you to approximate the quantum gates pretty well. Um, there's, a, there's a definite conjecture that tells you exactly which TQFTs should be good enough to do quantum computing, to talk to quantum computers in this way. Uh, but it's very, very hard to prove, and part of the point of classifying examples is to, to try and uh, get more evidence in this conjecture about which ones are good enough for quantum computing. Uh, you can also think about how efficiently you can approximate things like quantum gates. That's actually maybe not a super exciting question. Uh, and then it, I think a really interesting one is to try and think about which TQFTs might actually be implemented in quantum systems. So at the moment, the only examples we have of these are basically, there's basically two examples. TQFTs that, well, physical systems described by TQFTs, they were sort of discovered by accident, and two of the simplest TQFTs. But there are other TQFTs out there, some of these ones we've discovered, maybe they will be more convenient or better for talking quantum computers with. And there are a bunch of really nice ideas called, well, under the names of string net models, or lemon wayne models, or other things like that, um, that give you hints about how you might take some TQFT that you particularly like and engineer some physical system that's actually described by there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in that sort of reverse direction at the moment. Instead of analyzing these systems by TQFTs, trying to uh, engineer physical systems that are behaving according to TQFTs. And yeah, that's it. Thanks very much. Well, I have time for questions. Yeah. So, so you said that in your transit to which state you can do TQFT. Yep, yep. Um, uh, we can approximate the, the quantum. Case. Yes, yep. Um, is there any chance of having a different computational system that reflects better about TQFT3, which is kind of beyond quantum logic? Like a different logic where, where all of your TQFTs um, oh. do something. Oh, no, no, no. I don't know. Yeah, no, no. I mean, the, the, the dichotomy is actually pretty stark here. Yeah. The, the TQFTs that are good for quantum computing do quantum computing, and the ones that don't are really, really, really boring. I mean, the, the ones that don't are essentially TQFTs that you built out of a, a finite group in some really simple way, and it's pretty clear that there's just nothing useful to do with them. Okay. They fit the axioms of a TQFT, but it really seems like a very sharp divide. Either you are universal for quantum computing, or you're incredibly simple. I'll show you that I forgot to do this as we're going through. Let me show you the three places that this comes up. Um, first of all, is in amazing fact number one, there are multiple ground states with the same lowest energy. Okay, when you have a, a quantum mechanical state um, where you've got a few different states with different energies, uh, as time evolves, uh, these states evolve differently. Basically, um, one way of thinking about it is that as time evolves in a quantum mechanical system, each of these uh, states uh, had a little uh, e to the i theta times t sort of base factor that's mixed up. But these thetas are different. They're basically the energy of the state. So you have e to the i theta 0t for the lowest state, and e to the i theta 1t for the next one, and so on. 
So if you have to stick your code of information in a bunch of states with different energies, you very quickly lose the phase coherence between the different states just as time passes. And I mean, this is sort of the fundamental problem in quantum computing. You want to squeeze everything down in one multi-dimensional state all at the same energy to preserve the phase coherence. And so the fact that these systems have really tight degeneracies is the first is the first thing. And then yeah, the second two things are um, well, the state doesn't depend on anything except the topology of the system, and uh, and uh, you, can, you can afford to sort of screw up the gradient as long as you get the topology of the gradient right and get the right energy. But this is the fundamental one: the, the energy gap is really small. Yeah, of course, she's on the Twitter. Sorry, the new dimension of the quantum brain is that some kind of representation of the energy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. Um, um, There, all the representations you get here, you can get from just thinking about um, the universal art matrix acting in the tensor power of a representation of the quantum field. Uh, um, <laughs> sorry to change the level a little bit there, but I think you know what most of those refer to me. Um, so yeah, they're, they're exactly the representations that are able to come from quantum fields. Um, it's a little bit of work to see how the, the gradient back in a bunch of disks correspond to those representations. Very basic one. If you compare the quantum computer to probabilistic, yeah, yeah. do I infer correctly that this means that a quantum computer can never do deterministic calculation? Oh, um, well, um, quantum computers can do all reversible deterministic computations. So there's this little issue that uh, any any quantum circuit is. Well, that is unitary matrices, so you can always undo it and get back to where you started. So you can't do you can't do calculations that intrinsically throw away information. So you can't exactly simulate an AND gate by itself because an AND gate is an irreversible process. It turns out that's not a big deal, and uh, with sort of some extra auxiliary bits, like allowing yourself to use a few extra constant zeros and constant ones, that sort of pure irreversibility isn't isn't actually a big deal. But no, I mean. Uh, you, you, you can run all reversible classical computations, which is essentially everything on a quantum computer. And you wouldn't want to, because the first quantum computers they're going to have are going to be ridiculously tiny things that are incredibly weak and incredibly expensive and only have a very few number of bits. And you'd never want to run a classical algorithm on them. You don't really want to do something that, that uses this intrinsic quantum data. But I, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, computer science speak, P is inside BQP, that's the deterministic polynomial time stuff, and that's the, the quantum stuff. And in fact, uh, BPP is a class of things you can do with coin flips as well, uh, definitely since it's So you can, in fact, do both of these with quantum flips. But you wouldn't want to I'm curious, as a, with classical computation, adding a coin gate gave you something. Yeah. Um, is there sort of anything that people know of that you can add to the quantum model that gives you something that you don't have? Oh, to go even further up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. I mean, uh, but well, okay. So, um, I mean, you should ask a computer scientist who knows this whole computational complexity hierarchy. Um, the what's a I guess I don't know of anything that's kind of particularly physically realistic. realistic. I mean, you can do silly things. I mean, you can always give yourself oracles access to special to, to things that just solve some problems right away. You can let yourself do post selection, which is this thing that I talked about earlier, shooting yourself if you don't like the answer of your computation, continuing in other parallel worlds. Um, but none of them, right. none of them right. tend to be sense. Things you can actually do. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> what counts as a two-dimensional quantum field theory? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm a bit puzzled with this. Um, okay, I'm just going to be a yeah. physicist one. Yeah. So no, no, no. Okay. If you're only dealing with electrons and, and, and photons, it's what we call a Ewing theory. Okay. If you want to have non-abelian gauge groups, you've got to start making boundary quantum fields. Yeah. 
products and buildings and so on, and that doesn't seem very practical. Oh, okay. Building a computer. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> so, so this is a this is a lovely thing. So, um, the so you know, for example, the the spin statistics theorem in physics is this amazing thing that tells you that for every fundamental particle in the world, when you turn it around by by 360 degrees, its quantum mechanical state either comes back exactly where it started or it picks up a minus sign. So in particular, if you turn around twice, it gets back to exactly where it started, which in my sense makes sense. And this is a fundamental fact about the three-dimensional world. You use the fact that you're three-dimensional to, to prove this. But it turns out there are in these in these systems, there are particles that break the spin statistics. They're, they're not honest particles that are actually physical things. They're what you will call quasi-particles. They're just uh, they're I won't try and say the physics word, but say what they are. Um, for me, they're the simple objects in the, in the tensor category that describes the symmetries of this, of this quantum field theory. You have to have the physics word, actually. But the amazing thing is that now you can see that, uh, so in the, in, for these quasi particles, you, you get much more interesting grading and much more interesting statistics. You can get particles where you're taken by two pi and you pick up other trajectories, not just one and minus one and so on. Um, and well, and, it, and it's no coincidence that the, the directional quantum hole effect here is that it really is a two-dimensional system, and the spin statistics theorem doesn't apply for in, in two dimensions; it only applies in three dimensions. And we're using the fact that sort of the, the excitations of this, of this system really are constrained by two-dimensional huddle to let us get away from the spin statistics theorem. I don't think I answered your question. Well, that, you sort of have because I, I, I guess I was concerned that that. If you really wanted to start to stick to using electronics and not something a bit more complicated than yeah. electrons and photons, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, but it sounds like that's not a problem. That, no, that, I mean, that we're, we're, we're sort of working with the, with yeah. the effective excitations in the system yeah. rather than the microscopic ones. Just like I mean, in superconductors, you, you deal with everything in terms of Cooper pairs instead of the yeah. instead of oh, individual yeah. electrons, yeah. Right. and it's sort of the same here that there are collective excitations in the system that are better than the statistics than the individual. This last thing that I talked about, uh, where was it? This idea of which ones might be implemented in terms of physical systems. This is really, really cool because it, it, it's a recipe that takes a TQFT and tells you how to write down a quantum mechanical system that's built out of honest fundamental particles, bosons and fermions and so on, but that still have the right effective description. One last question? Well, if not, then that's thanks for coming in.